Hey, hey everybody, hope you're doing well today. We're gonna take a dive into aggregate demand, both understanding the diagram and the components that make up aggregate demand. It is a critical macroeconomic concept and we need to get our brains into what aggregate demand means. And we're gonna start off by looking at the graph of aggregate demand and comparing it to the microeconomic demand curve. So here we go. All right, take a look at these two graphs, right? Macroeconomics, and this is thing you're gonna, so this is the macro, macroeconomic aggregate demand curve on the right here, and the micro demand curve over here. And you've seen this curve um, in, in previous videos for microeconomics. But macroeconomics considers the working of the whole economy, including all the goods and services that are demanded. So while the microeconomic demand curve has price right here on the vertical axis, right, the macroeconomic um, aggregate demand curve has a measure of the average price level for all goods and services in the country. And likewise, where the, micro, the microeconomic demand curve has the quantity, in this case for iPhones, of one good down here, the macroeconomic demand curve has the total quantity of all goods and services, which is national output, which can also be expressed as real GDP. Thus, the aggregate demand curve shows the relationship between the average price level and real output. The two different diagrams here, I put them here so that you could see that they look very similar, right? But obviously this has aggregate demand one, average price level, real GDP. This could also be put down here as output or national income, we'll talk about that. Over here, instead of using P1, we're gonna use PL1. Um, we're gonna use Y1 down here instead of Q1, Y representing national income. Okay, and obviously you can see here that the aggregate demand curve illustrates the inverse relationship between the average price level, right, and the total real output demanded. So at, low, at the lower average price level down here, right, a higher quantity is demanded. So essentially this is the law of demand on the aggregate level. The word aggregate simply means total. Therefore, in constructing an aggregate demand curve, we look at the demand for all possible sectors of the economy, which is what aggregate means. It means total, right? And then we use that for the, and then we on the, on the vertical axis, of course, we use average price level. Okay, so this gets us to trying to figure out, like, what makes up all of the components of this line? And if you saw the gross domestic product video, the gross domestic product GDP video, you found something very interesting, and that is there's a relationship between gross domestic product and the components of it, and the aggregate demand curve. So here's a blown up version of it, right? Average price level, Y over here, 81, okay? And um, take a look at it, and the, the, the other thing that's kind of cool is, of course, we're gonna put on here in a little bit, and the aggregate supply curve is a little bit different. There's gonna be a short run aggregate supply curve and a long run aggregate supply curve, and there are two whole schools of thought as to what happens with supply. But this is the beginning of another Rule of Eleven video. You can see it, right? You can see all the components of these compulsory things you're going to need. Average price level, the currency, PL1, 0, Y1, real GDP, aggregate demand, 1, short-run aggregate supply curve, 1, maybe the long-run aggregate supply curve if you're looking at it from a neoclassical standpoint. And, of course, the title. Okay, so just a blown-up version of the graph. So what makes up... Aggregate demand, the components of aggregate demand. Well, aggregate demand is, can be expressed as GDP, which equals consumption plus income, excuse me, consumption plus investment plus government spending plus exports minus imports. And if you saw the video on gross domestic product and understanding what it means, you saw this exact same slide. You could just, you could take this, right? Cross that out and put AD right here, and you have the same exact uh, calculation. So what does it mean? Well, consumption is the total spending of, of, by households on goods and services. That is some kind of spending that makes up the overall total demand, aggregate demand, total spending in a country. What else does? Well, investments, right? Investments are firms make and new capital. Our school just built a beautiful new 
Um, Fine Arts Center, what was that? That was an investment. They borrowed money to do that. Households also do that. If you, if you ever buy a house or your parents have bought a house, investments in real estate and homes, that means that you usually borrowed money from a bank. And that makes up the I component of GDP or aggregate demand. The G component is government spending. The government, of course, spends money on public goods, whether through its uh, providing health care, providing education, the military, um, providing clean parks, um, police forces, government spending, new bridge products, projects, new highways being built. So G is the third component of aggregate demand, which is also the third component of, of gross domestic product. And the fourth component is X minus M, which means you take the exports, right? Those are things leaving the country, but the money's coming into the country. Minus imports, those are things that um, are leaving the country, no, no, that is money leaving the country, but, but products are coming. So exports are products leaving the country. I think I said that backwards. Leaving the country, but the money is coming in, right? Imports are items that are coming from outside the country into the country, right? But the money is flowing out of your particular country. So the spending of foreigners on goods produced by our country, in this case, I live in Chile, are exports, minus the spending domestic consumers, Chilenos, make on goods produced abroad. Okay, so those are the components of AD, aggregate demand, and they're the same components of gross domestic product. And here's something that I like to show students often. Here is the AD equals C plus I plus G plus X minus M. And in a way, and this isn't totally true, but if you think about it, here is the aggregate demand curve out here, right? Well, that is a collection of expenditures. So let's say the consumer spent this much, right? Plus what the investment is, what, what, what happens with firms and money borrowed by, by private people, by, by individuals, plus government spending, plus the difference between exports and imports, and you're going to get a total consumption line of aggregate demand. So it's just a nice way, I think, of thinking about this. If you think, look at C plus I plus plus G plus X minus M equals AD, then if you took all of these, all of these components here right, and added them together, you would get aggregate demand, and which is represented, of course, by this line by this line that is out here. Okay, so just a way of thinking about it. And that helps because if consumer spending goes down, then obviously that's gonna have a ripple effect and that's gonna pull aggregate demand in. If government spending goes down, well then that's gonna have an effect on where this line is, right? So if you think about all these lines, like separate lines adding up to aggregate demand, and any one of them goes out or in, it's gonna have an effect on the overall aggregate demand curve. Okay, just a nice way of thinking about it. So another way of thinking, another thing about changes in aggregate demand, if all of a sudden government were to, like, all of a sudden start spending a bunch of money, like the United States, right, the Obama administration years ago started the, the National Health Care Program, and that was a massive government spending project, right, and that's going to push aggregate demand out. Why? Because there are people who did not have health care before who are now receiving it that the government's paying for, and that's going to be an increase in aggregate demand, not just for the government spending, but also policy probably for all jobs created as a result of the expansion of the health care program. Okay, but what about, what about if one of these components goes down? Let's say consumer spending drops. If consumer spending drops, well, obviously you're going to have a decrease in aggregate demand down here to 83, and that didn't come out very well, nor did that in the little um, uh, transfer I made here. But, but you get it, right? If the AD is here and any one of these four components goes up, then aggregate demand is going to go out. If any of them goes down, then aggregate demand is going to go inward, you know, all things held equal. So that's a why I like the previous slide, right, of, of C plus I uh, plus G plus X minus M. If you see that there, this is a collection of little kind of small demand curves, don't think of it. I mean, just use that as a way of remembering how it affects aggregate demand, and I think you'll be, you'll be really helpful. It'll be really helpful to you. So now let's take a look at what kinds of things would influence changes in aggregate demand. So C plus I plus G plus X minus M. Let's break them down. So what would change? What are the components of changes in consumption? Well, the first thing is that changes in income, and this is probably the most important significant, most important significant, the most significant determinant of consumption, 
right? As one's income increases, there's going to be an increase in aggregate demand. If, as incomes decrease over the country, there's going to be less aggregate demand, okay? So a growing economy where incomes are rising will be an increase, there will be an increase in consumption and therefore an increase in aggregate demand. And of course, the opposite is also true. Okay, now interest rates. Let's take a look at interest rates and how that affects, how that is affected by um, people's consumption. Okay, so interest rates, interest rates, remember, are the price of money. And the price of money, right, is, 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 is a determining factor of whether or not people borrow money. So if interest rates go up, right, money becomes more expensive and there'll be less consumption. If you have a 10% home loan, you'll be less likely to take the loan of $100,000 than if it's 5%. So if interest rates go down, money becomes less expensive and you're more likely to buy the house. Okay, buying homes is the largest consumption that most consumers will make in their lives, and higher interest rates also leads to more savings. That's another thing. If you have higher savings, right? If you have um, uh, the interest rates are higher in the bank, you're going to be more likely to save money because you're going to get something for it, right? Whereas if if not, uh, why would you put your money in the bank, right? If you're only going to get like 0.5 percent interest rates, then why would you then why would you leave money in the bank? Okay, so that is changes in income, changes in interest rates. Now, take a look at changes in wealth, okay? This is um, kind of a, something different for students to think about. If adults kind of get this, but the amount of consumption that one would spend depends on the amount of wealth that consumers have, right? Income is the money that people earn, but wealth is made up of the assets that people have. So this includes things like houses, art, antiques, jewelry, monetary and financial assets, you know, money in the bank, so if there's a change in housing prices, if I own a house and it's worth $100,000 and there's a 10% change, I just made $10,000, kind of. If I sell the house, I've made $10,000. But I feel wealthier. In fact, I actually am wealthier. If the house goes down by 10%, you're going to feel poorer, even though nothing really happened. But you're going to be less likely to spend. So changes in wealth affects people's interest in consuming and, and will affect aggregate demand. Same with the stock market. A drop in the market uh, makes people feel less likely to spend and vice versa. If it goes up, people feel more wealthy because their retirement money is going up. So those are things that affect people's willingness to spend money. Um, another thing that would do that are household indebtedness. And so the extent to which households are able to borrow money. If credit cards are really cheap, and I live in Chile, and you can get a credit card for practically walking into a bank and saying hi, um, then 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 people will be more likely to spend. If you have a credit card, I opened up a credit, I opened up a savings, a checking account here in Chile and I got three credit cards. That's a cheap credit, right? Um, so if you can get money cheaply on credit, then you're more likely to spend. There's a danger there, of course, because if you get really in debt, like you have high household debt, then at some point um, it's going to catch up to you and you might cut your spending. Okay, so those are the changes in consumption. What about changes in investment? The first thing is, I think, pretty straightforward and obvious, and that's a change in interest rates. Um, interest rates, firms need money in order to invest. Firms get money in two ways, either by retaining profits or using their savings or borrowing money. Most firms actually borrow money. If the interest rate's low, people are going to borrow more, and there's going to be an increase in aggregate demand because there'll be an increase in spending. Um, interest rates are high, it'll be less borrowing. So there's this inverse relationship between interest rates and the level of investment. Okay. Also, changes in investment are going to be affected in the level of the overall national income. Right? As incomes rise, this leads to an increase in consumption. And the national incomes rise in consumption and consumption increases, there'll be pressure on existing firm, on the firms to do more, to build more. Build more houses, to build more homes. Uh, those are the same thing, to build more malls. Like there are more malls in Santiago now than there ever have been, right? And that's because incomes in Chile are going up. Another reason could be the technological changes. Um, technology is a pretty dynamic thing. In order to keep up with advances in technology, people will tend to invest in technology. So the more technological change there is, the more investment there's actually going to be in firms because you've got to keep up. Um, and then the last thing doesn't seem like much to a lot of students, but it's actually really important, and that's expectations and business confidence. If businesses make decisions about the amount of money they want to invest based on their future expectations of the market, 
So if they're more confident in the future, they're going to invest more, which is going to be a, a push outward of aggregate demand. The less confident they are in a, a, a prosperous future, the less likely they're going to spend a bunch of money right now. And so the, the economists regularly measure this confidence of business, and they publish this thing, at least in the United States and, and, and globally in many places, about the business confidence index. It means like how excited are people about um, businesses about the economy, right? The confidence in the economy. So there are two more changes in the components of aggregate demand. What about changes in government spending? Well, this depends on a lot of things, my friends, right? I mean, the political views of the, comp the political power, um, previous commitments through subsidy programs, previous commitments um, that it might have to certain sectors of society in terms of benefits, the elderly, the poor. So changes in government spending can happen quickly. Um, or they can happen kind of slowly, but many times the government's actually sort of locked into things, and it can't change um, it changes its spending that quickly. Okay, and then lastly, change in net exports, and this is the X minus M component of aggregate demand. And how would this change? Well, exports. Exports are pretty interesting. Um, if you live outside of your home nation, you might understand some of this if you buy things from your own home country. Um, you know a lot about the influence of interest rates on incomes in different places, on trading policies. I live in Chile, and um, the, 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 the ability for Chilenos to buy things um, abroad has increased their need for imports. Um, and so foreign incomes, if you own, a, if, like if you are Chile, and incomes are going up in China, and China, the Chinese then are more capable of buying Chilean goods, then you're going to see an expansion of foreign of exports out of your country, and that's an influx of money or an injection of money into your country. Trade policies can affect that. Exchange rates affect it a lot. In my four years here in Santiago, the exchange rate in, uh, for the peso to the dollar has gone up by 25%. That means that it is 25% it is cheaper to buy Chilean goods if you are not in Chile. So the dollar will buy you 25% more of a Chilean good. That's great for exports. Um, if you're a Chileno and you want to import things, your buying power has gone down 25% to the dollar. So that's not good. But exchange rates have a big influence on, on the ability for other people from other countries to buy your goods, as do trade policies, obviously. And the last thing are imports, right? National incomes, as and I kind of got this mixed up a little bit, but but national incomes, as Chilenos become more 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 wealthy, they're more likely to buy products that aren't from here. Buying products from the United States is easy through something like Amazon.com or they buy European goods. Trade policies, the United States has very open trade policies with with uh, with with Chile. It's trying to to expand its, its, um, its ability to trade with this country. And as a result of that, imports can get much cheaper. In terms of exchange rates, as I just said, if you're a Chileno and you earn pesos, boy, oh boy, you've taken a 25% hit on your ability to buy things that are made in, or priced in dollars. And that could be something um, like a jacket you want to buy online, or it can be the price of gasoline at the pump because the exchange rate affects anything that's priced in dollars. And of course, uh, ma many of the major commodities in the world are actually priced in dollars. Okay, so that is the video on aggregate demand and all of its components. Understanding this is obviously really important for you to be able to understand um, how demand is affected by various components in the society. And the last video that you need to check out coming up next is the fiscal and monetary policies, which are the tools of the government to affect demand. Um, all of these things you really need to have clear in your mind before you go on to aggregate supply, because if not, whew, you can really start swimming. Okay, So take your time. Take a deep breath. It's going to get clear. You can do this. Um, and once it's in your mind, that's the beauty of economics. As I've said this before, once it's in your mind, it's there. And it's really exciting to look around, the, look around at the world around you and have a further understanding of what's going on. All right. I hope you felt, thought this video was helpful. And we'll talk to you in a bit.